Hey, this is Matt once again. Welcome back to another video. This is a paid request for Lucas. Thank you so much for that. And for those interested in requesting any type of videos, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down in the info box either over there or over there to be getting pretty much any type of video. Topic, reaction, video game, let's try, playthrough, movie review, commentary, what have you. Now what's ironic or interesting is that a little while ago I got a commentary from another guy, Sean, to do a commentary on Back to the Future Part 3. And then just recently I got a request to do a review of Back to the Future Part 3. So it actually worked out. It gave me a chance to rewatch the film. And now that I've seen it, I could give my clearer thoughts on this movie. So thank you, Lucas. And thanks to Sean for the commentary request. Here's the review. And when I was watching Back to the Future Part 3, I kept thinking to myself that it's still hard for me to put into words why I don't love this film. Because to recap, when I grew up, Back to the Future 2 is the one I saw the most when I was a kid. And if you ask me what my favorite was as a kid, I would say Back to the Future Part 2. I still quite like the film. Nowadays, I would say the first film is my favorite. I think the first film, I really like the story. The father-son being in the same school together. The build-up. The, the music. The, the heart to it. Maybe, I almost want to see the strongest narrative of the three. And the second film, I love the adventure aspect. It felt, and maybe that's why as a kid I grew towards Back to the Future Part Two a lot more. Because of all the different timelines and how cool the future looked. And the weird costumes and the Jaws holograms. Jaws 19. Char still looks fake. The hoverboards, uh, it felt more like an action film. And you had the future, but then you also have alternate, alternate 1985, but then you also go back to the 50s. But we see the first film again, but from a different perspective. That felt the most creative of the three, and the most adventurous and action packed of the three. So I, I do really like the second film. And again, the first film I would say is my favorite. Because of I did the the story and the way it's told the the build up. This one I remember hating when I was a kid. When I was a kid and growing up to my teen years, I'm like I hate this film. Now if I watch it, no, it's not a bad film. I don't hate it. It's just one of those films where I watch and I go. It's fine. It's kind of the reaction I have. It's fine. I mean, do people really not know the story about the Future Part 3? Do I really need to go into the story of it? Uh, why not? It's a review. By the end of the second film, they fixed things. The sports almanac, they destroyed it. Their timeline is reset to how it was previously. Before Marty McFly had the sports almanac and the older Biff took it and gave it to his younger self. And the guy got rich and turned Hill Valley into a hell zone. His dad was dead. His mom was married to Biff. Now everything's changed back to normal. But now it was during a lightning storm. It hit the DeLorean. Doc disappeared. Marty got this letter showing that Doc is back in 1885. So by this film, he goes to the Doc, Christopher Lloyd, that's in 1955. They find out that Doc back then is actually going to die at a certain time. I'm going to go back to save him and bring him back home. The Doc at that time is able to find a way to, with this change DeLorean to go back 
through time. Goes to 1885, chased by Native Americans. One of the bows, one of the arrows, I should say, hits something on the car, so it won't work right. Marty gets chased by a bear. Gets into town. Meets Mad Dog Tannen, played by Thomas F. Wilson, who is Biff and the other <laughs> versions of himself in the first two films. You have a scene of Saloon. They almost hang Marty McFly, but Dot Brown saves him. They get back together. And then the rest of the film is either Marty McFly dealing with this character art they give him in part two and three about being called Chicken, being called Yella. He goes gun ho gets pissed about it, but it always leads to bad things happening. And that's a bit from part two where apparently in the future Marty's guitar hand got screwed up from this car accident. We see that play out or almost play out at the end of this film with Needles played by Flea from Red Hot Chili Peppers. Which I always remember him in Son in Law where he's like the tattoo guy. You pick it and I stick it. Actually doesn't do a bad job as Needles. Uh, that's the name of the character. Uh, that leads to the Marty McFly in the Wild West having a possible standoff gunfight with Mad Dog Tannen. On the flip side, Doc get into a love story with Clara, played by Mary Steenburgen. And the story goes from one to the other, although I would say this is more Christopher Lloyd's movie. It's more Doc Brown's movie and his love story. Until you get to the finale with the train sequence where they gotta use the train to push the car to 88 miles per hour to hopefully go back to the future. Now, positives I'll say about the film. It's great to see Michael J. Fox again. Always been a big fan of him. Sad what happened to him with the Parkinson's. It's a damn crying shame. Does all you all you hear is good things about him. I liked him in these Back to the Future films, The Frighteners. There's a TV show I saw him on called Spin City. Of course, he started with Family Ties. I didn't grow up with Family Ties. I know of it, but I didn't grow up with the show like others did. So I saw him in Casual. Casualties of War and with Sean Penn and other movies. In particular, Back to the Future. Great actor, likable, does a good job here. Christopher Lloyd, another guy I'm a big fan of. He was in The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai. He was in uh, uh, Star Trek Three: The Search for Spot. He was the main bad guy, the, the clean-on. Really liked him, even in Suburban Commando with Hulk Hogan. I was frozen today. I liked him in that. He was good in this film called Nobody with Bob Odenkirk. Action film. Came out a few years ago. So, really enjoyed Christopher Lloyd. It's nice that his character gets a bit of a chance to show a emotional range. And has a bit more beat in the script to play with. So, that's nice to see. It's cool to see people from the previous film. Elizabeth Shue comes back as the girlfriend of Martin McFly. She shows up at the end of the film. Leia Thompson comes back to play a different character in the Wild West. Where she's with this guy who is also played by Michael J. Fox. Because the second film... Well, even the first film... I mean... Some characters play different versions of themselves. The older, the younger versions, Leia Thompson and Crispin Glover did. And this, and the second film, it was even bigger where Michael J. Fox is Marty, but also in the future played his son and played himself older and played his daughter. I'm like, what's that? It's play his dog? <laughs> All that stuff. So it's nice to see the characters come back, or I should say the actors, to see the actors come back. The train sequence, I think there's some good stunt work, especially when it's getting faster and faster, and its top is blowing from going so fast, and you have the doubles 
of Christopher Lloyd and Mary Steenburgen and even before that when our two characters are traversing on top of the train they get to the front in order to overtake it and commandeer it. There's some good <coughs> good stunt work there. <coughs> and it was nice that it was an actual end to a trilogy. How many times have they said this is going to be the last one? It's the end. It's going to be the last one. And then it's not the last one. This is one of the few, few, few times they actually went with it. So it makes the ending feel more satisfying. The characters are treated with respect. It's a harmless film. The fact it doesn't do anything to damage the previous films or hurt the previous films. And they give characters that we liked a happy ending. You know, spoilers. Marty gets back. He's with his girlfriend. He finally gets to drive that truck from the end of the first movie. He's able to change his fate where previously he would have listened to being called a chicken and his pride overtake him and get into this race with Flea's character, which would have resulted in a car accident that would have screwed his life up. But he learned a bit of something in this, this film, changed his ways, things worked out for the best. Christopher Lloyd, he found love, and then he got a family and, and kids. Things worked out for him. They were able to share one last goodbye and go their separate ways. So it's a nice ending that if you like the characters, it's nice to see them go out and not be disrespected, which is becoming more and more rare if you think about it. Because let me go on a tangent, bear with me. Think of other franchises, right? Rocky. Well, we get to see Adrian. Well, she passed away. Pauly, he passed away. Rocky, he got cancer. If they make another Cree film, they probably will have him pass away. Or, you know, off screen. Even Rocky Five, he loses his fortune, loses all the stuff he built up and that was depressing enough in Alien 3 oh Aliens great ending got newt conquered her nightmares can sleep no everybody dies <laughs> Hicks, Newt, Ripley, even Bishop they all die Captain Kirk he falls off a damn bridge or whatever dies with his, none of his friends around, and the only one who buries him is Picard, a guy he met for five minutes while cooking some breakfast. Spock, if you go on the timeline of the J.J. Abrams films, he went through space and time and tried to help this group of aliens, this other race, and it didn't work out the best, and he was blamed for it, and Then wasn't like one of the the second or third film, he just died, you know, on a moon or something. Like he was isolated by himself, kind of depressing. I can't remember the details because I don't like the J.J. Abrams films. So forgive me if I got stuff wrong. But it just goes on and on. Rambo, he almost dies, but then. Instead of going full circle and coming home, now he's going to be on the run because he's wounded. He gets on a horse, he rides away. Cops are probably going to get there and go, where the hell is this John Rambo guy? So he's going to be on the run or some type of thing. It's not really a great ending. Final note for Rambo. That did thankfully he doesn't die, but still. Listen to John Wood. He supposedly died. I know people are like, he's not really dead. Well... As of right now, he is. And... It's not really a... Gr I don't think it's a great ending to his character. That's my opinion. I know people don't agree with that. Oh, well. And it just... So, it go, clerks? Look at Dante. For, uh, you know, oh, he got married and... Gonna have a kid and... 
great ending of Clerks 2? Nah. She died. The baby died. He has a heart attack. Then he dies. And people like this stuff. I don't get why. Because it happens in real life. This ain't real life. These are movies, entertainment, escapism. We watch these movies to escape the more than likely sadness of our lives or what the bad stuff going on in our lives. Not to relive it. But anyway, that's a whole other tangent thing. So it's nice to have... And of course that's because Robert Zemeckis and Bob Diel have written it in their contracts. Nope. No Back to Future Part 4, at least as long as we're alive. So, there you go. Which is great, because, I mean, other than there was a cartoon, some video games, a ride at Universal Studios, it was as built to death, especially as a movie franchise, compared to so many other stuff. So it feels stronger for it. With all that said... I just think the film is fine. I don't love the film. At number one, I don't really care about the Wild West setting. I didn't grow up with westerns or really liking westerns. Except Young Guns. I always love Young Guns. But, you know, as I've grown older, there are other westerns I've seen and enjoyed. Tombstone, Rio Bravo... The Man With No Name Trilogy, High Plains Drifter, even comedies like Blazing Saddles, you know, among other stuff. So there are westerns I enjoy. Is it in my top five favorite genres? No. But, you know, there's some I like, but it's not my favorite go-to motif, uh, genre, backdrop for a story. I just, I don't... I know people, not all, but some romanticize the Old West. I'm quite the opposite. I I would never want to be there. I just, so it just it's just not enticing. Uh, it's not something, well, as a kid, I want to be a cowboy. I was never like that. <laughs> as a kid, I want to be John Rambo, but not a cowboy. So there's that thing. But nah. So the, the backdrop, I wasn't big on... As much as it's cool to see Christopher Lloyd have more to do as Doc and Doc be, in a way, more of the focus of the film. Again, this is more his film than Michael J. Fox's film, although Michael has a, quite a bit to do still. Well, as in he's got stream time, but I'll get to that. But on the flip side, I don't care about Dot's love story and love life. And I know that sounds stupid or mean or whatever. Because like, well, wait a minute, Matt. You like Christopher Lloyd. And I do like Mary Steenburgen. But just, I really didn't give a rat's ass about their love story. I didn't care about the lovesick love letters of life of Doc Brown. And maybe that's because, you know, as a kid, I'm watching, you know, part two is the one I watch the most. And it's such this big adventure and the creativity and special effects and the future. Like, it just felt more mundane. Now you just say they try to go back to the smaller format of the original Back to the Future. I can understand that, but. And in the backdrop, the story, it just wasn't as exciting. I wasn't as invested with it compared to others, I guess. So it just wasn't for me. And what else I could say? The At times, I thought the film was pretty boring, to be honest. I don't mind the last 20 minutes with the, the railroad hijacking and then the stuff that wraps up the trilogy try to tie the dot the i's and cross the t's so to speak but it's just like the 
other than the ending, the other bits of action, I'm kind of like, uh, whatever, wasn't memorable to me. The music, while Alan Silvestri is nice to see him come back, I much prefer the stories to the first two. The new songs, like the ZZ Top song, Double Back, I never liked that song. I never cared about that song. I would never listen to that song on my own. And I don't mind ZZ Top. I like their version of Viva Las Vegas. I never care for their song in this one. Definitely nothing compared to the Huey Lewis songs in the, the first one. I grant there weren't really a whole lot of songs for the second made specifically for it, but the store really propelled that film to me. Here, some of the score balance of Usher is pretty good. It's a great composer, but I just prefer the first two more. Again, the ZZ Top song I didn't care for. Uh, the sets, the, the way the, the town looked, because they built this whole Wild West Hill Valley town. And I hate to say it, even that did not look impressive to me. It looked like a set. Which is uh, funny how Hollywood had all of these Old West sets anyway. Because they would build a town and then a bunch of people would film TV shows or other low budget westerns on these bat lots but instead of using one of them is like no we need to build our own but it still looked like just maybe that's because just the 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 lack of environments or locations if i mean it's weird to say look what i think of the film you know after the beginning it's like okay they're either in the barn where Doc and Marty are trying to figure out how to fix the car and come up with the plan of putting in front of the train. So it's either the saloon or it's the... I mean, it's either the barn or the saloon or a few shots outside, including the hold down. And that's, what, like, that's all I remember, is just these very few sets or locations that just made it seem like a more mundane film even more so than the first one like the first one felt like a bigger movie I know that's not going to make sense to people I don't know how else to explain it it just the sets didn't impress me the the look of the film I didn't mind some of Dean Cundy's camera work, especially in the, the third act, but I, I just the look of the film and the set dressing just wasn't that impressive to me. Even compared to other westerns like Tombstone and you know, other films of that nature. So I, I was, I mean, the love story I wasn't really that gun ho about. I, I appreciate it more than I gave a crap about it if that made sense and the actors do their jobs well but I just wasn't for some reason I it's hard for me to explain I wasn't that totally invested with it and the first two are more Martin McFly st I mean you could argue the first film is maybe more about his dad but it, to me I still felt it, it was more about Marty which made sense, because Michael J. Fox is the star of these two, uh, of all these movies. I did, I did it that, okay, let's give Doc Brown some time to shine. But maybe that threw me off as a kid, is that I'm so used to everything going through Marty, that when he he's there, but it's, maybe as a kid that threw me off, and that still maintains in my head, even to this day. So I look at a film where it wasn't as big, as adventurous, as action pat as uh, grander of a scope as the second film was. Because like you said, you're, go, you're flying through the clouds and you're in the future and all this stuff that happens there. And then this alternate eight, 1985 hellscape that Biff has created and then even going back to the first one. So it wasn't as adventurous to me as the second film, and it wasn't as funny 
as the first film. Because it has jokes here and there's maybe two I chuckled at. One is when he's shooting, where'd you learn that? 7-Eleven. Which is a nod to him playing the video game in Back to the Future Part 2 at the beginning where one of the kids is Elijah Wood. But one of them says, you play that with your hands? That's a baby's toy. But here now he just a shoot a gun for real. So I did like that line. And also when he's thinking of going out there and having the showdown with Biff. With a bad dog, I should say. Thomas F. Wilson. And it's like, he's an asshole. Like the way Michael J. Fox said that that did make me chuckle as well. But those are the only times. The other humor just felt... I know you say maybe some of this humor in the first two felt more like a sitcom. This felt even more so like a sitcom and the jokes part of it. Uh, trying to think like... Oh, golly gee, I have the car parked. Oh, there happens to be the bear. Oh, no, here's a bear coming towards me. Oh, here's a baby. Oh, the baby pissed on me. Oh, but I did get away. Oop, I stepped in some horse manure. Uh-oh. Oh, Michael J. Fox gets up. He's in pajamas. And pajamas are showing his bottom. A bit of his bottom. Uh-oh, SpaghettiOs. So it's like, okay, just uh, so the humor just... I didn't think it was as fun or, or witty as the first film. Or even the dads in the, in the second film. Like the, again, the Jaws 19 hologram and the, how funky they made the, the, the future look. And again, as I'm watching the film, I'm sitting there going, okay, it always felt like the slowest film to me and the most boring film to me. Again, it's not a bad film, but again, I remember as a kid, like if when I tried to rewatch it, I would kind of just fast forward through it until I got to the finale. And then I was like, well, if I were to rewatch it, I would just watch the first two and then I'll remember the finale in my head and just pass by it. So yeah, the Back to the Future Part 3, it just never grabbed me like... And I know it, people love it. Now when it came out, it box office wise, it made money worldwide. It made, what, $240, $245 million worldwide. And I think it had a $40 million, yeah, they have $40 million budget. But you saw like the second film made 118 million in the US and the third film only made 87 million in the US. So you definitely saw a decrease. Now, whether it was because of the competition, although 1989 hell, I'm not gonna say that because 1989 had a, had a hell of a lot more competition. Batman, License to Kill, Lethal Weapon 2, Ghostbusters 2, Honey and Shrunk the Kids, there's a lot more going on with that. So either maybe A, maybe there are people, a light B, who didn't like Back to the Future Part 2, so they didn't want to see the third one. Or maybe there's a lot of people like B, that like Back to the Future Part 2, but then it's like, oh, it's a Wild West setting, and I don't know, it's like, there's hoedowns, and what's going on here? So again, while I appreciate what it did in terms of ending the characters on a respectful note. I just, I could never get that much. I never loved the film. I probably never will. And unless a, it's a request to, I don't know, do a stream with someone or a commentary with someone, or for some reason re-review it again, I will probably never see the film again. Again, there's some nice moments between our two lead characters. I do like the getting on the train, the stunt work with that. 
But like I said, the, the story just felt slower to me. I, I just wasn't as invested, like dealing with the backdrop and stuff. Even just to look at the sets, it just wasn't as interesting to me. It just felt, it felt cheaper. I know that's stupid to say, because the budget, it wasn't cheap, but it just felt, looked cheaper to me. Like I said, I like that Christopher Lloyd has more to do, but I'm not in love with the love story. I hate to say it, baby, because I never really need to see a Dot Brown love story. I never really asked for it. <laughs> to be honest, I never asked for it. So, at the end of the day, it's fine, it's okay, but I never loved the film. But take that for what it is. Thanks for watching. Thank you once again, Lucas, and we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye for now.